Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, good afternoon, welcome to this press conference on support for Ukraine, where do we stand? Relaunch of the Kiel Ukraine support tracker. My name is Leonard Schütte, I'm a senior researcher at the Munich Security Conference. Ukraine is under heavy military pressure. Russia is intensifying its attacks on military and civilian targets, and at home Vladimir Putin is ramping up the defense industrial production and defense spending. But just as Ukraine is perhaps facing the most sensitive military situation since the early months of the war, support for Ukraine in the West is showing signs of fractures. Republicans in Congress are increasingly reluctant to support Ukraine and are holding up the next US aid package. While the EU did manage to eventually pass the financial support package, uh, it too will fail to provide uh, one million rounds of artillery ammunition as it promised and is struggling to ramp up industrial production in Europe. And Ukraine fatigue is beginning to set in uh, across Western populations. Recent data gathered by Kex CNC for the Munich Security Conference shows that while most people in the G7 are aware of the massive repercussions that a Russian victory in Ukraine would mean not only for Ukraine but also for Europe, public approval for actually doing more for Ukraine than they are currently doing is steadily declining. As we write in a recent analysis, which you find in print um, in the room, more Germans are now against than for delivering more weapons to Ukraine than they are currently providing. In many countries, there seems to be the belief that they're simply doing enough, or at least doing more than others. But the reality is that more support for Ukraine will be necessary, and more support for longer for Ukraine to liberate its territory from Russia. The war is showing no sign of abating. Vladimir Putin is transforming the Russian economy into a war economy. And Ukrainians, understandably, are unwilling to make any territorial concessions in order to end this war. In a war of attrition, the winner is the one who outlasts the other. And to outlast Russia, Western support for Ukraine will be critical. And this is one message, hopefully, that this Munich Security Conference will send to the world. So what is the state of Western support for Ukraine? How do we actually know who has done how much for Ukraine? How can we best measure this? And which countries are actually living up to their own pledges? To shed light on these and other questions, I have with me Professor Christoph Trebesch of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, where he is director of the Research Center on International Finance and Macroeconomics. Most relevantly for our purposes here today, Professor Trebesch uh, is the creator of the Ukraine Support Tracker, which is a database of military, financial and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. We are delighted that Professor Trebesch will launch the updated data set of the Ukraine Tracker here with us this afternoon. Please keep your questions for the moment. There should be ample time for Q&A afterwards. Professor Trebesch, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here and to have the opportunity to present uh, the latest update of our project. Um, let me just give you a brief um, roadmap. Uh, so I'm gonna, just going to give a very short uh, presentation, s starting uh, with um, uh, an introduction of our new aid allocation measure. Um, so thus far, we've mostly used commitments, so promised uh, aid. Um, now we have a new measure that uh, we term allocation, meaning that this is aid earmarked or specified for delivery in the near term. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this new measure that is a, gives a much better picture of aid actually arriving uh, to Ukraine. Okay, so this is the big novelty of the report uh, uh, this time around. Uh, but um, we're also, of course, updating our usual commitment numbers. So this is the 15th update, and everything is up on our website uh, as of this morning. Um, we'll also briefly discuss data quality issues. Um, we've got a new transparency ranking for weapons. We also have done several benchmarking exercises, for example, compared to French uh, recent report on military aid. And all of that is summarized in a new 15-page research report 
that it can be downloaded on our website, right? So we have uh, kind of the old methodology paper and now a new updated complement of that that pours into this issue of allocation, how that measure works, main results on that measure, and uh, uh, yeah, the, the details of what I'm going to talk about today. All right, this is um, a summary of where the commitments stand by donor group, right? So you see the EU member uh, members, so EU member countries and EU institutions, so this is Commission and Council, and we add up all commitments from the start of the full-scale invasion in early February, in late February 2022 until January 15 of this year. So the span of the data goes until January 15. And this is, you know, one of the graphs that we used to show using this classic commitment data. And you can see that there are two colors. One is the dark one, which is short-term aid. You can think of that as aid uh, pledged and, and uh, likely delivered within the same fiscal year. But we've seen more and more multi-year donor packages, right? Several European countries in particular have set up uh, packages over three, four, five years, so making planning much more, much better, but complicating the use of commitments as main data uh, measure. Why you can see here, so you see the light shaded uh, blue bar, uh, which shows that the EU has committed, we know that, the big 50 billion Ukraine uh, facility. Uh, and of course, uh, and several other countries have also committed these large long term aid. Uh, commitments, uh, packages, and of course that distorts somewhat the picture if you compare a country that provides aid in the, in the shorter term and another country that has this very long plan um, when you compare commitments that can bias, uh, bias uh, the, the, the rankings, right? So the rise of multi-year aid programs complicates the use of commitments. That's kind of one an issue we faced more and more. So we're uh, glad to kind of, I'm glad to present a, uh, a new measure that we're introducing, and that is possible because governments have become more and more transparent. Um, the, uh, when we started, commitments were the only reliable, usable statistic, because this is where governments were actually rather transparent about. Now, there is most, many of the, or actually most of the main donors have designated websites, very detailed information on their Ukraine aid, and this allows to kind of expose, set up a data set until early 2022 of the allocations, okay? So what do we mean by allocations? Let me be precise. The definition is that aid that is earmarked or specified for delivery in the near term, okay? Allocation is not delivery, right? So because governments will not communicate when a certain uh, tank or a certain hovitzer is literally delivered to Ukraine. But the, the, what governments do comment on is on the allocation, so the kind of the last step before delivery when they uh, agree on a military package and a list of certain weapons uh, that are sent, that are to be sent, and that is what we mean by allocation. In the case of financial aid, allocation is nothing else than disbursement, right? So this is, this is a, a, a measure, if you want, between the commitment measure, promises, and the delivery measure, somewhere in between, closer to, to the delivery side. Good. To show you how this data works, uh, let, me, let me point to the U.S. case, because this is kind of gives the intuition of the difference between commitments and allocations, okay? The bars, the spikes, if you want, are the U.S. Congressional Acts, okay? This is when they passed, um, meaning that new money was allocated, was, no, sorry, new money was committed to Ukraine, okay? Uh, and this is for the military side, right? So this is just, just military aid from those Congressional Acts. And then you can see those, the, the, the dotted lines, which show basically a drawdown of usable funds for specific military packages over time, right? So you can see in this graph very clearly kind of the up and down and now how U.S. aid has run out, okay? Uh, we are uh, not seeing another commitment spike. This is the whole, uh, basically the, the summary of, of, of our current situation. There's no more funds to be allocated for specific new weapons, okay? So what we used to have were the spikes, the bars. Now we also have the dotted lines for every country uh, in our data set. This is another way to show this, right? Uh, we show the dotted line is now commitments, and we can track 
the allocations of both military, the darker orange uh, marked area, uh, and financial aid allocation, the lighter orange uh, area. Um, and you can see how this accumulates over time. Okay? You can, this is for the U.S., total aid, right? This is military and financial and humanitarian, which is, which is marginal as a whole in the, in the entire picture. This is the same graph for the European Union. You see that the EU commitments, and that was in our data set, which reported on it for um, yeah, multiple months now, that EU commitments have increased a lot since the Ukraine facility has been announced. It has finally been approved in February 24. All right, so, so we already have it in our data set since mid-2023. Uh, and you see that if you, tr if you trace allocations, you get a very different picture. So this is why it's important to make this you know, kind of methodological step forward, uh, you can actually see the gradual increase in those uh, allocations uh, for delivery in the near term of both the military aid, which is the darker area, and the financial aid, uh, the lighter area. Um, and the key takeaway here is really that there's commitments and allocations me measure something very different, and there's a big gap between commitments and allocation, especially uh, for the EU, which means, of course, that... Ukraine doesn't have all this money, uh, ha hasn't benefited from, from, from the commitments, right? What matters is the allocation and the delivery, of course, but it also means that the EU has still uh, a lot of leeway to actually deliver aid to Ukraine. So two sides, uh, two perspectives on the same issue. One key insight from the allocation data that was really a surprise to me, I've, again, I've, we've been working on this for almost two years now, um, is that Europe, uh, so if you take the European Union member countries, European Union Commission and uh, Council, uh, and we add Norway, UK, uh, Switzerland, um, and, uh, uh, um, and Iceland, so the European countries not member of the EU, uh, we see that Europe was ahead of the US all along. And that's very different from some of the older messages we had, right? Because now it's possible to actually look back and understand what was really going on in terms of actual effective aid flows to Ukraine. And that's quite a, to me, uh, just was a big step in understanding, you know, kind of a, in a retrospective of the dynamics of aid over the past two years. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side of the total aid allocation, so the blue line, Europe as a whole, is always above the brownish line, which is the United States, and then you move to the right side of the, uh, to the second panel, that's military aid allocation. You see that the United States is still ahead in military aid allocation, uh, but Europe is catching up, although dynamics have somewhat slowed in the past weeks or months. Right? Uh, but the gap between Europe and the U.S. Is, does exist for both commitments. There it's very large, uh, nearly twice as much, but it's also large with regard to actual aid allocations. Okay, so that's kind of a, the, one of the big takeaways, um, that uh, after all, Europe did provide uh, significant aid from the start, uh, which is, you know, might be due to the initial uh, untrans intransparent uh, data situation that we just couldn't capture that until now. The allocation data also allows to you know, make these country-to-country -country comparisons. And this is one for military aid allocation over time, so we can very nicely kind of trace when which weapons were allocated, which military packages were prepared for delivery. Um, and you can see the big takeaway from this uh, graph. This is billion euros, okay? And this is the full two-year uh, uh, period we now cover. Um, what you can see is that the Nordics, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and Germany are now far ahead of other European donors. Um, so they've each allocated uh, almost, sorry, almost 10 billion in military aid to Ukraine, uh, which is uh, almost twice what the United Kingdom has allocated and is far ahead Poland, Italy and France. Uh, we'll talk about France, uh, you know, I might talk about it in case of questions. Uh, the data for these three countries is incomplete. This is what we can track, uh, but it might be, it should be interpreted as a lower bound. It might be higher. But what's clear is that these are really large differences either way. When we place, don't look at GDP, uh, sorry, when we don't look at billions, but military allocation, a percent of country 
GDP, so the donor GDP, uh, we see a somewhat different picture, right? While the Scandinavians are still ahead, um, we see that the Baltics are, uh, have uh, allocated a significant share of their GDP to Ukraine in, in military aid only. That's quite sizable. We're talking about uh, more than one, or in the case of uh, Estonia, more than 2% of G the GDP actually allocated uh, to Ukraine. Uh, this is, this is, uh, and the surprise, another surprise was the Danish case, which have, they have stepped up considerably in recent months uh, and are now uh, um, you know, on par with Estonia. Next comes a group of, of, of donors. You know, the, 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 the German ranking here, um, of course, is much lower because of its large GDP. Uh, so German, the German actual aid allocation is comparable to uh, that of Poland, Slovakia, Czechia, Netherlands, or Britain. And then there are other countries uh, where uh, the, the share to GDP is much lower. Okay, one question that obviously comes up with any kind of project like this is the data quality, right? Much of this is uh, uh, collected uh, by hand, by comparing and, and, and trying to create a consensus uh, in, in, in the best way possible from the best sources possible. And what we, you know, emphasize in the report and what is important is that the quality of the sources we, we use are, has much improved since we started this project. Uh, now, 93% of all the uh, you know, several thousand entries in our database are now backed on actual official government documents, right? This is a, quite a big change from the start of our project where we had to use, like, Twitter announcement by, by ministers of defense or, uh, you know, press conference statements of the prime minister, so quasi-official sources. Now we actually have government websites, government reports, um, uh, confirmed uh, fiscal documents, etc. Uh, and ni so 99% of the total aid in our database now builds on high-quality official sources. Right? This is quite a change, uh, which increases the reliability. Uh, there are a few exceptions, like Italy, France, and Poland, where that is not the case. Um, we also have a new transparency index on weapon delivery. So there's quite a heterogeneity in how transparent countries are on their delivery of weapons. Some countries don't talk about it at all. So if you're interested, they can show you details on that. It's all in the report. Uh, and maybe to some, it might be interesting to, to uh, learn about our benchmarking exercises uh, for France, Netherlands, and UK. We do these to check the quality of our database, right? So France, for example, or the UK came out with a new report uh, revealing new information, right? Official confirmed deliveries, officially confirmed commitments with a full list, and then we can go back to our data set right before the release of that new report and check what, what did we cover, where we correct on, on all the items, what did we miss, right? So we do these benchmarking exercises. We've done already, you know, 15, 20 of these, and there's three new in the, in the update report uh, with the most, biggest, biggest deep dive in the, in the French one. There, there was this big new parliamentary report. I can talk about it uh, if you're interested, but the, there's a large overlap uh, overall with this, with this report. So I would uh, probably close it uh, with this few initial statements uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, you know, the, the, the question of uh, who has done how much for Ukraine has really entered public discussions over the recent weeks and months. And I think having such a, such a tool that brings scientific research to public discussions and allows all of us to transparently track how countries are doing and potentially hold them accountable is of immense public service. Um, so I encourage all of you to have a look at the report and have a look at the website. Now, this is a press conference, so um, this is a space for all of you to ask questions. Uh, so please raise your hand. We have a microphone in the room, uh, and I will give you the floor. Quick question. Yeah, it works. Yeah, uh, Rick just here at Radio Free Europe. Um, obviously, many French officials aren't happy about uh, the Kiel Institute and think that you know you're not getting it right. Basically, that's usually what I hear from them, and they are saying that uh, there's a reason for this is that they don't want to publish data because they don't want to help Russia. Um, how much credence should we give them? for this sort of, uh, their, their explanation why their figures are so low? Um, well, I mean, the, uh, the big uh, change in, 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 with regard to France is they now issued, there was a parliamentary 
report issued, pretty detailed um, or wrong uh, report. Uh, so with that, for the first time, this is not a government document, so it's I would call, probably call it quasi-official, but um, um, and this allows us to kind of assess the statement based on some you know something we can actually work with, and I can you know briefly go into go into those results if you're if you're interested. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean. Uh, so what we did is we went, of course, through the entire report. And uh, I mean, with France, the problem is, yes, exactly as, as you say, uh, there is a policy of not revealing systematically. But it's not that France wouldn't have revealed uh, anything. The, whenever they, um, or often when they do send weapons, there are statements uh, by quasi-official sources, by uh, ministers uh, uh, on delivery of weapons. We use that information. Uh, so any quasi-official information we could get and from which we had at least two sources was in our database. So we do try to capture as much as we possibly can, uh, you know, being, being uh, uh, constrained by the, by, by the policy of, of not, not revealing that. So the report gave us a chance to check for a very intransparent country how good are we? How, how, how representative is this data? And the, the good part, thing about the report, that in the, in the appendix of the report, there's actually a list of weapons sent. Um, and we focused the comparison on heavy weapons, because those are the, you know, those are the most reported on, the most, arguably the most relevant on the battlefield. Uh, and on the, if you look at the, this is a table we have in the report, um, the bottom line is that we captured or we correctly identified all heavy weapons sent by Ukraine, if you use the heavy weapon definition of the United Nations, right? So uh, with that, the, the artillery, the air defense, the armored vehicles. And uh, uh, if you add missiles to that, we also captured the large majority of missiles, but missed the mistral. So on the minor, more minor military gear, uh, the non-armored vehicles, uh, helmets, and all this, you know, more smaller military items, we are much less complete. But the big items uh, we, we catch, uh, here is, uh, you know, you can, you can compare. Uh, in green are those that we correctly identified. And this is when the units of these weapons are, uh, so how many of these weapons have been delivered. And you can see that in some cases we even have numbers where the report does not have numbers, right? So we are, the, the report shows more information. So our database has more inform had more information than the parliamentary report uh, then revealed. Um, in one case, the Cesar, we, we missed nine units, right? Uh, we knew about the press rumors on these nine, but we didn't have any official source, so they're not in the database, okay? Uh, and then we also compare the aggregates, um, uh, where basically the APF contribution, of course, uh, uh, we, we, we do have. The special support fund was announced after the last release, so it wasn't in, but is in now. Uh, military training is generally not counted in our database. Um, and then they have this 1.7 billion number, um, which, uh, you know, for us is hard to reconcile. We can get to 700 million. Uh, we've, we've, we have a long explanation in the note. I can go into more details. But the bottom line is that uh, maybe just to show you kind of what would this do to the overall uh, ranking in this particular uh, figure, right, if we would use the 1.7 billion, right, this is the allocation numbers. Uh, if we use the 1.7 that, uh, that the report um, uh, uses, uh, France would move up uh, from, from, its, uh, you know, from, from uh, this position to that position. And that's just the military allocation and the bigger ranking. So this wouldn't change any of the bigger rankings currently on our website. So in a, in a way, yes, we can, you know, this is helpful. Uh, but it's e even if the if we just take the, those, all those numbers at face value, we integrate in our database, uh, it wouldn't change much of the big picture. I think this is the most important takeaway. Uh, so we can disagree, you know, that there's some uh, difficulty in, in really reconciling those 1.7, but overall it seems, it seems pretty clear that this is, it's not the way we compute, the way we code, the way we gather sources. It's really an issue of levels, I think.
Thank you very much. Thank you for taking my question. Frank Hofmann, DW Deutsche Welle. Um, we have also heard from French officials that they negotiated with you. Could you um, reveal a little bit what you were talking about? And a second question, if I may, uh, were you ever able to quantify the help the European Union is giving to Ukraine in terms of giving access to data uh, of the Galileo system, which has a value, of course, as well, I think. Thank you. So. Um, I don't know of negotiations. I mean, uh, we we generally use uh, uh, publicly available data. That's kind of our iron rule, where we take what is publicly out there and can be um, uh, can be um, um, you know shown as evidence when we collect this data. We don't use information we get by email or in negotiations. So I, I'm not aware. Um, yeah. That they negotiated with us? Okay. I mean, maybe he talked to, uh, some of the staff talked to ours. Like, I, I didn't, I mean, this is, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy about any additional information, but it has to be public. But I, I'm not aware of any uh, explicit <laughs> negotiations. We're not, I mean, this is, we're collecting data. Um, on the Galileo, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, our database shouldn't be misunderstood as a, uh, the final word on any help on Ukraine, right? We are uh, trying to do our best to track, for example, the refugee uh, support for refugees outside of Ukraine, uh, which is not easy uh, given the data constraints. We're also not tracking, for example, the military training, as I mentioned, and we're not capturing those uh, important uh, co contributions like, uh, as you said, um, access to the Galileo system or access to intelligence. We are not quantifying that. We are quantifying weapon, deliver well, weapon aid, uh, we're quantifying humanitarian aid, and we're quantifying financial aid. Those are the three categories. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's what we do. Yeah. We wouldn't have that. Yeah, there was a question here. Yeah, yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, have you tracked there being any sort of cancellations from original um, you know, commitments to, because you've said it, it's difficult then when it moves to the delivery stage, but, you know, has there, given kind of uh, budgets being difficult for, for governments, they will make commitments, but perhaps they'll reduce them and, and so forth. You know, are you seeing anything like that? Can you point to any reductions or announcements that, that, that have changed or are, are being cancelled or delayed? So what happens in a few cases uh, is that at the end of the fiscal year, a certain part of money hasn't been used. That happens uh, quite a bit. We, don't, we, didn't, we never coded it systematically. Uh, in the case of the U.S., it was quite a bit. It was a double-digit billion number um, where, you know, the fiscal year ran out in, in August and then uh, the aid was just gone. The, 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 some, it's, it's not very transparent how much of those unused um, resources are then transferred into the new commitments for the next fiscal year. Uh, that's always a bit of a puzzling together. Um, we can't probably do it very systematically, but we haven't, uh, like, there are a few, few cases that are now up on my mind, but I can ask the team uh, where there's outright consolation where people c came out and, but, but, you know, this is with the caveat that, of course, on individual weapons or something, that there, are, there are, of course, examples where um, there were initially some initiative to deliver a certain number of tanks and then it didn't happen, and that, those same, that, that of course, happens. But uh, in terms of big commitment packages, um, I'm not aware of many examples, but I'm, you know, I'm, we might be, be by, in touch by email and, and I'll ask the team again whether there is uh, anything big. Thank you. I'm Josh Persona from Politico. Just a, a question on, on your engagement now with countries, because your data is becoming increasingly important, especially in the context of the negotiations at the EU level about the future of the European Peace Facility. Um, Schultz is now regularly citing figures and comparing Germany with France, etc. Uh, have you come, first of all, have you come under any pressure, do you feel, from governments or um, ministries of defence uh, on your data? And secondly, um, it, do you see any instances where, where countries want to overstate the value of their aid to Ukraine? Thanks. Yeah. 
So on the first one, no. I wouldn't say that we feel increasing pressure by governments. Um, I think the the fiercest, you know, back uh, lash or the, the fiercest um, uh, grilling was in the first six months of the project, uh, where we had to, you know, get everything sorted out and 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 uh, where you know individual weapon deliveries would would change a lot in the overall rankings, and we had lo lots of scrutiny. I mean, we continuously have scrutiny, we continue to get feedback, but not so much from governments. It's more you know open source intelligence people, we you know more individual. Uh, um, um, we're, we're always very happy about even citizens or government officials that point us to published sources, right? Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't kind of uh, view it as pressure. I would rather s we, we notice that there is more interest from the official side in letting us know if we missed anything. Um, in most cases, we already have those information, those reports, but in a few cases it indeed helps. So, uh, you know, I encourage anybody to, if, if they know of a report in their country, which we didn't consider, let us know. We're very, very uh, uh, interested. Uh, overstatement, yes. I mean, this is, um, uh, it's a problem with the commitment data, right, which we have now alleviated somewhat. Um, so uh, it's hard to say whether you will really deliver on those billions and billions and w or whether ultimately you will cancel it, which was your colleague's question. Um, a, a nut we still have to crack with the allocations data is the valuation of weapons, right? We, we tend to rely on what governments tell us on the, what the valuation of those weapons are. And um, as far as I understand, most countries use uh, book values um, or purchase values uh, for, for every of those, um, you know, for every of those uh, estimates by the government, we do these benchmark exercises. We use our own prices, we use our own estimation and compare it uh, to the official statement whether to see whether it makes sense or whether there's like a complete overvaluation, which is kind of your question. Um, the problem is that some countries use replacement values, right? Which is like valuing the old 1980s Hovitzers that you sent at uh, the value of brand new Hovitzers that you use for your army to replace those you sent. Um, that is a problem, and that's also the case in the French report. Um, it's, it's telling that the, the US Pentagon uh, apologized for erroneously using replacement values. Um, in, in various uh, reports and was reported in the press as a kind of a accounting error, right? So um, some governments use replacement values. Uh, it is one possible way to do it, but it tends to inflate numbers. So I'm cautious when I see that. Um, and uh, it's hard to, you know, not every country says exactly how they do it, how they value the weapons in their packages. That's why we do these benchmarking exercises. Um, but if so, if there is overvaluation, it's either via committing some pie in the sky amounts in some future years, or by using these replacement values uh, for weapons. Those are the two main, I think, uh, infl inflation, <laughs> inflating mechanisms. Just quickly to come back on that issue, I don't want to make it all about France, but, but just to be clear, you, th that was the case in the November 23 parliamentary report from the French, they also use replacement values. Yes, so in the report they argue in favor of using replacement values. So they have this 1.7 billion number, which again, I mean, doesn't change much of the big picture, but okay, if we, 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 we in the report we really go into depth in trying to reconcile that 1.7 billion number, we, you, we get to 700 million even with upper bound numbers. Um, if we use the highest number on any, so one problem is that we don't have the number of weapons. The other problem is that, you know, this replacement value issue. But yes, they, they use that. But even, so in other words, without the some prices that are much higher than the ones we use for other countries, we wouldn't get to 1.7. Okay, perhaps whilst you gather further thoughts, let me abuse the privilege of being the moderator for, for a question of my own. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we see in some public opinion data an incipient Ukraine fatigue. Now, you've updated the data set. You've got new figures that cover the previous months. Could you tell us a little more about whether you see such fatigue also reflected in, uh, in the commitments and the allocated aid, uh, or whether that is perhaps a false perception? Mm -hmm. 
So overall, we are um, the dynamics are lower now than they were a year ago. That's very clear in the data. So we've seen uh, from the fall of 23, we've seen really a collapse, which we kind of communicated in the previous two uh, report releases. Um, there has been a little bit of an uptick since our last update. We always cover these kind of six weeks uh, um, of, of, of data. Uh, so there was a, a bit of an upward trend now, so it's not continuing to decline. Uh, but what we see now in the allocations data is that there is a decline or kind of a, a plateauing, not for all countries, but for, for you've seen it for France and, and uh, so uh, for, for, for Poland. The UK isn't as active as it used to be um, in terms of value, right? I'm talking about individual weapon deliveries, you know. And, 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 so in some, yes, we are, I mean, I don't know if it's fatigue, but just factually we see less commitments and less uh, allocations. The big exception, of course, being the 50 billion Ukraine facility, which we already had in our database, which is now, you know, uh, actually finalized and secured, uh, which is, of course, a, a game changer for the, for the budgetary situation of Ukraine. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, just because you, you brought it up, the UK then, um, you seem to be suggesting that the kind of funding is, is leveling out. I mean, the UK announced yesterday they've just entered a, a recession. So just in terms of forecasting, do, do you predict that, that the UK funding will, will, will struggle in, in coming years? I mean, that's beyond, uh, beyond. I mean, economists are good in analyzing past data, but are terrible at forecasting anything. Uh, uh, doctors too, by the way. Um, but uh, so it's hard. I, I wouldn't have a, 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 founded, a founded answer to that. But uh, if, the, if the past year is a predictor of what would come, we will see, we'll not see these very high commitments and very quick deliveries as we've seen on the Johnson. Right, so we we really see a, a somewhat of a shift in in the past six months. Uh, so if there's no f no no change in that kind of uh, overall stance, then I'm uh, you know we are likely not going to see those old dynamics. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so much food for thought in the report and in the presentation. I'm taking away at least two things. Uh, on the one hand, I think it is clear that with plateauing aid for Ukraine, much more needs to be done on both sides of the pond. However, uh, right at the beginning, Professor Trebes uh, stated that indeed the EU has been leading the US on Ukraine aid all along. And I think that is an, a very important message that you're sending, which should be he heard loud and clear. Uh, on, on all sides. So, Professor Trebisch, thank you very much for taking your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.